Hi everyone, I'm your host Noor Anand Chavla and you're joining us for the video series of the New Indian Express where we speak to very interesting personalities and today of course I have with me the legendary Sabira Merchant who has just released her autobiography and I'm very excited to read it, my copy is in transit. So let me introduce our guest today. Sabira Merchant is India's beloved thespian, celebrated quiz queen and renowned grooming and etiquette expert from bringing disco to Mumbai with her nightclub Studio 29 and in the process ushering in a new era in Mumbai's nightlife, from causing frenzy among party goers in the 80s to training beauty queens such as Priyanka Chopra and Lara Datta before they went on to win their crowns, Sabira's legacy is a lasting one. She started her career as an actor and became very popular on television with her show, What's the Good Word? She is a renowned thespian and etiquette trainer and has worked with India's top corporates to train their workforce in social behavior, corporate finesse and etiquette. In her latest memoir, A Full Life, Sabira recounts her eventful journey, her triumphs, setbacks, joys, fears and hopes, and through her journey offers a rare glimpse into Mumbai's glorious past. Let's welcome Sabira Merchant. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. Thank you so much. And I hope we can lovely chat together. Yes. All right. So, ma'am, please tell us about your fabulous journey, uh, your full life. Maybe you can summarize it for our guests today. You've been an actor, presenter, an etiquette trainer, and so much more. Please, we'd love to hear from you. Well, uh, it all uh, actually started way back when I was a little girl in Bandra. And uh, um, I was in school in St. Joseph's Convent over there. And my love for the theater was very apparent. And I did a couple of plays back there in school, which excited me very much. And I always remembered that thrill that you got just being on stage and that blood that raced through your system. And um, I, I, I sort of thought to myself, hey, this is maybe something that I'd like to to look at kind of thing at that time at the tender age of maybe 13 or something like that. And um, then of course uh, I moved away and um, I met uh, the love of my life, my husband. Uh, it was, I mean, I was just all about 15 when I met him, which was such a long, I mean, think about it nicely, how can it possibly be, but it was. And um, we were, you know, in, were, well, introduced view marriage. His parents sent a proposal and uh, we, we got to meet each other in, you know, the traditional way. Somebody introduced us and somebody was present and we started speaking and we liked each other very much at the first go. So that's how uh, my life with Chotu started, my husband. And um, after that, of course, we never looked back. We fell in love and uh, decided to get married. And then um, promptly had three wonderful children, one after the other. And you wouldn't believe, Noor, that I mean, it's something so shocking even to me when I think about it now that at 21, I was the mother of three kids. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I would. I, I can't imagine how you did that. <laughs> I, I don't know myself how. How did I do it? And what was I thinking about? I mean, you know, I just had the children, and the children were growing up, and I was growing up with them. Yeah. So it was. Yes, it was a good process of learning. I was learning things, learning to bring them up, of course, and I was learning how to handle myself. As, as a young woman and as a young married woman, there was so many responsibilities suddenly. I mean, from being a free and easy bird, suddenly you get married, you have to run a household and you have suddenly have so many children. So of course it was a whole lot of juggling that went on over there. And um, then when I was just about, uh, I had had uh, my third kid, uh, I, had, I was uh, over 21. And in 1964, when I must have been just about 24 or something like that, I told my husband, I said, I think I'd like to start acting. And he thought I had flipped. He said, 
what's the matter with you? <laughs> you know, um, you, you can, why, why don't you do one thing? Why don't you play bridge? <laughs> I say, that's something that's not up my alley at all. And why, why the hell would I want to play bridge? He said, because all the stylish ladies of today, they all go to bridge parties and, and they have bridge parties and that's what's considered the correct thing for you to do. I said, no, I'm not at all that kind of a person and I'd rather go on stage and act. He said, but how do you know you can act? I said, well, uh, the only way is to try. So I went to theater's foremost couple, Pearl and Alec mm -hmm. Padamsee, and um, they interviewed me and um, I was offered a role. There were Four, four girls in the fray and um, we all sort of tested for the role mm -hmm. and uh, fortunately I landed the role. It was in a play called The Word, W-O-R-D and it was written by Pratap Sharma who's a very well-known playwright mm -hmm. and he used the voice of, uh, of Durdarshan and the voice of uh, of all these um, films that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the, the films that were shown in the theaters and stuff like that. So everybody knew him as a newsreader and stuff like that, but he was a very good playwright. He'd written this play. So promptly I started acting and I, I didn't realize, of course, so many lines to learn and come home and mug those lines and, then make them appear absolutely natural when you say them. And so it was a little bit more than what I had envisaged taking on. I thought it's just going there and just acting. And I didn't realize the, the underlying difficulties, but then I, I went through them, of course, and I, I enjoyed myself doing it. And I got very good reviews in the play. So uh, in those days, we used to have a critic or Mr. Matthews, and he used to um, give us all a critique in in the Times of India, and we used to wait anxiously for that to come out the next day. So uh, anyway, we uh, I, I I was I, I had very good mentions, and then I was promptly ordered. I mean, offered many other roles like uh, the Wild Duck and Three Sisters, and. Uh, many others and uh, this is I'm just basically speaking about my theatre in the meantime my children were growing up get them schools and put them through you know, the nitty gritties of childhood nursery school and they all went to a lovely school called West Wind dropping them to school picking them up giving them lunch the regular things about growing up with the family and doing this acting on the side in the evening. So the thing was, it would take me away from say 6.15 or so and right up to about nine o'clock. So there was a big chunk, which I'd miss out in the evening with, of course, with the children and with my husband. I, and he, he missed me at home, but he was a very giving husband and he realized how much it meant to me. So he just let me get on with the theater, which of course remains my first love to this day. That's, that's um, quite interesting, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it was very gutsy of you in 1964 to have done that, to ca have carved an identity for yourself as an actor, being a mom of three. That's really amazing. Yeah. And, I, and I remember when, because I played, you wouldn't believe, no, but I played the part of a schoolgirl. <laughs> wow, yeah, that's in amazing. The and I, I looked like a schoolgirl because I was, I mean, as it, I didn't look like I was 24. I looked like I was much younger. And so I was cast as a schoolgirl. So there I was in a school uniform and acting it out. It was, uh, it was growing up then. And, um, and somewhere along the way, one of the plays, uh, Adi Marsban, who is really my mentor, uh, this was the plays were with Alec Padamsi and Pearl Padamsi mm -hmm. and uh, Adi Marsban spotted me and um, asked me to uh, come and be on the radio. And mm -hmm. I said, do you think I'll be I'll be OK with it? He said, oh, yes, yes, you'll be fine. 
you're a confident young lady and you'll be fine on the radio. I said, I won't make any gaffes, you're sure. And he said, no, 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 you just have to read from the script. But you've got to be very careful not to make a single noise. You can hardly breathe. It's that, because it's it all goes out live. There is no retake and take. Just go there, you take your script, you read, and all of Bombay and Maharashtra listens to you. That's true. So I handed at the radio. So from acting, first acting, <clears throat> then the radio with Adi Marzban, and uh, met a lot of people like Jerson Dukuna then, and uh, Roger Pereira, and Bomi Kapadia, and lots of interesting people then. And of course, then the radio, the life on over the radio started. And that also meant going out at night because the radio programs were like 8.39 at night and beamed out live. So I had to be there. And it uh, means again, going away from the family and going out late at night. But my husband was very, very kind and understanding. So he allowed me to, to, to do all this, which was a great thing. And um, then in my, again, in my theater career, Alec Padamsi came up with this idea of uh, doing um, a streetcar named Desire. Lovely. Tennessee, that was a brilliant play. And just before that, um, the, the studio happened. I mean, simultaneously, let's say the studio happened. And um, the, the idea came to me, we, we had uh, bought over the lease of a hotel on Marine Drive. Mm -hmm. with together with uh, a Parsi family, the Vazifdars, and they were the Parsi family who were with me. And um, I met us again, everything happened so much by chance. It was flooded and um, the, the waters of the monsoons were not receding. And I was caught at the hairdresser with this other lady. And um, her name was Daisy Vazifdar. And she said, I, I've got a very high SUV, so maybe I can drop you home and you can leave your car at the hairdresser. So I did. And then she took me to her house and I met her husband over there. And her husband said, you know, there is this, this hotel going uh, on Marine Drive, but it needs the, the Muslim, Muslim owners, it needs Muslims to apply for it, for the permission to run it. And I can't do it as a Parsi and I already have a hotel and I have experience in this line. So would, would, would you like to sort of think about it? Wow. Just How like that. I said, well, sounds, sounds good. Let me check it out with my husband, you know. So there I came and with, I told my husband all about it. And he said, it sounds like a great idea. Why don't we try it out? So we got the hotel. So in the middle of this, there's a streetcar named Desire coming up and the hotel at the same time. And uh, there used to be um, a barber shop on the ground floor of the hotel called The Wanderers. Mm -hmm. And um, a very popular barber shop. So it was doing well. And um, at, at that time, Life magazine came out. And on their cover, they had disco takes over. It was a whole big thing about disco taking over. And there was a picture of a woman dancing on top of it with golden tights and everything. So I was like swayed by this. And I said, listen, this looks like a great thing to get into. Now, why we have this hotel? Why can't we try and get a discotheque going there? So I went to my partner and I told him, we'll have a discotheque where the barbershop is and we moved the barbershop one floor up he said, you know the barbershop would not be successful one floor up I said people will just have to take the lifts and or they'll just climb but let's do this thing he said but how does anybody ever dance to a record in those days we all danced to bands right that's there right. was all in the Willingdon Club or the band in the CCI or band somewhere else in a restaurant. And we all danced to bands or singers with guitars and things like that. It was unheard of a black disc being put onto the 
turntable and people dancing to it. So, uh, he he was a sport, and uh, it meant a lot of um, a lot of investment. But we pulled in and um, we invested the money, and uh, we went to London. We knew that the sound system had to be fantastic for this. So we went to London and we got in touch with a wonderful human being called Mick Jones. He was, a, he was a sound and light expert and stuff like that. So he knew how to do all, he'd done a couple of discotheques in London. So we got him down to India. He put the discotheque into motion and started construction where the barber shop was. Uh, the, and much more than the barber shop, we took a huge big area down, downstairs where there was a little dining area. We took all that over and we made it into the Studio 29, which at that time, nobody really believed. And people said, oh, Studio 29, what's it going to be doing? You know, it's just a place where you go and hear records being played. <laughs> But we had the light and sound show, which was an incredible light and sound show that we had to the music of Vangelis. And um, the opening night, we had a fair turnout and we made it into a membership club. So the membership became very, very popular. And we had to even stop taking members because we had overreached our goal soon and and i used to have a lot of fashion shows there and theater there and jazz concerts and uh, jazz ballet happenings and astad debu coming to dance so every week there was something new happening because i knew after a point people would get saturated with the same thing mm -hmm. they would need something fresh something different to, to rev them up so I, I kept introducing new things. Singers from abroad would come, like Boney M came, and Boney M came and sang at the studio. And it was it was such just great fun. That was the part that I think I had the maximum fun in my life was at the Studio 29. We had so many wonderful evenings and so many wonderful concerts there. And of course, in the middle of all this, the streetcar named Desire was also going on. So there I was acting during the day, leaving the theater, coming, checking up on the discotheque at night because we had to keep checking up on things, on, on the alcohol turnout, on people that's coming in, on the membership that was being given, on the candles, whether they were lit or not. I mean, from the smallest detail to do the biggest thing to check it out so i was one of the people who was doing that together with my uh the partners my partner was iftar his son feroz so he and i did a lot of the work together we got an excellent staff and of course the studio was a great success so that was the big thing and streetcar named desire in uh there was an all all india critics award oh wonderful and yeah, all the critics and from all over India write in and give their opinion as to what they think was the best production, the best acting that they saw. And they gave me the award, which was very good. So I Amazing. happened to that 1980 or something like that, uh, win the award as well. And the studio was doing excellently. So everything was, was, was looking absolutely rosy That's and fine. So how did you get into the etiquette side of things? And especially with Miss India, you've had a long association with them. Yes, a long association with them from, from 94, I think, I have, or 95, I have been associated with the Miss Indias. In the, in the middle of all this, you know, being in the theatre, people said, you speak well, why don't you come and teach others how to speak? So my workshop started and I, I had one uh, workshop just as a, a kind of an experiment and that worked out very well. So the workshop started and people started contacting me to give them workshops and teach them how to speak better English. And in the middle of all this, I wrote my manual. I had a manual uh, devised to show you the difference between taught 
and taught, for instance. There's a huge big difference. And people would say, he taught me how to do it. He said, no, he taught me how to do it. So all these things are manual and that, that, that I created the manual with the help of one of my students. We sat down and devised this manual. So in the middle of this, the manual was being devised. I mean, everything was happening in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And um, and then the messenger people contacted me because uh, they thought, well, here is a lady who speaks well and who's knowledgeable about other things. So they asked me, why don't you teach our Miss Indias as well how to speak and how to, uh, you know, portray themselves, go for interviews, etc. And so then the Miss the Miss India thing started. So everything was there right there, the Miss Indias, my teaching workshops, the theater, the studio. And, and what running about the Durshan? I, I do know that you've, you're, you were the face of Durdarshan for a certain kind of uh, role. So how did that come yeah. about? That came across also by with Adi Marzwan. I finished, I was doing the radio stint with him in any case, and he said, and I was acting, so he said, why don't we do a program on Doordarshan? Why don't we go on television? Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I mean, it's one thing to go and act in front of people. And it's another thing to go out to thousands of homes and be there and, and on a television screen where, where there is no response. Because I'm so used to feedback, immediate feedback from the audience. How is it going to be just looking at a camera? He said, no, no, we will try this out and it should work out perfectly. So he devised a, 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 first he devised a game, which was a drawing game to draw it out, he called it. And uh, it, that wasn't, we did a couple of shows of that and it didn't work out, didn't quite work out. And then he devised What's the Good Word, where three teams take part and they are, have a word which passes from one team to the other and they have to clue the meaning of the word to the second member would pass on. It was a very clever one and the people back home just loved it. It got such high popularity votes and gains that uh, I used to get mail in those days that, which would fill an entire room oh, of wow. Durdarsh. <laughs> so I, they, they put it into gunny sacks. There was no other way they could do it. So they put all the mail into gunny sacks and I would dive and take a handful of mail out like that and put the mail and then choose who to call. Because I would choose who to call from the mail that I received. Oh, that's right. The and call them up, give their, their numbers. There was no cell phone numbers. There were landline numbers. Call them up on the landline or write to them and ask them to come for interviews. So that was also very, took a lot of time. And then to research all the questions, Adi would help me, but otherwise it meant going to his office, sitting there with endless amounts of encyclopedias, going through questions and answers. And you see, people can write back, Noor, and, and tell you that, hey, your answer was totally wrong. And how did you give this? So I would have to uh, be very attentive to what the source was. Suppose it was the Encyclopedia Britannica, then I would write down the page. So all that would yeah. have to be researched well. So that was, there was no internet to help you back then. So it was actually a lot yeah. of work. But work just looking through tomes and tomes of uh, encyclopedias and working it out. So that, that took a lot of time and energy. But it was so rewarding. Even now, I mean, when people come across me, they say, oh, hi, what's the good word? Because this theater has a limited reach, yes. but this, this uh, television program is first shown in Bombay, then in Maharashtra, and then all over India. So it, it was everywhere. It was in Kolkata, Chennai, it was in Delhi, it was everywhere. So that's how I actually gained a lot of popularity was through that What's the Good Word program. And then, of course, and somebody said, why don't you write your memoirs? And it yeah. sounds very, so then the book came about to be. And that's so what that's I was coming it. to. You know, you have certainly had a very full life, but we'd love to know how long did it take you to write your memoirs and how did it actually happen? You know, you said that somebody told you to do it, but had you been perhaps thinking about it for a while 
before you actually embarked on writing them? No, I hadn't thought about my memoirs. I thought about writing about my manual, you know, the manual I told you that I'd devised about taught and taught and things like that. And um, Jacko approached me and Jacko asked me, why don't you write your manual? And then I thought to myself, hey, the manual is so dry. It's just got nothing much to offer except learning how to pronounce words and people I don't think are going to be that interested in doing it. It's a different thing when you're being taught that. And it's a different thing when you're reading it, it's not the same. So I said, why don't I write about my life, which is far more interesting than this manual. So then they thought about it and they said, well, it sounds like a good idea. So yes, why don't you do it? So that's how I started. And then we found somebody who would work with me closely on the book. And um, Jaco came up with a couple of names, but didn't quite work out. And then they came up with this brilliant uh, Mithali Parikh, which was absolutely fantastic. And she and I got along like a house on fire. She wrote beautifully and I could dictate to her and just unburden myself to her. And she'd be very great at asking questions and being incisive and stuff like that. So that's how we got to the book. And that's how the book is now there for people to read. Yes, absolutely. And we are all looking forward. I certainly am waiting for my copy eagerly. But I want to ask you, was it challenging to write about your own life? No, not really challenging. No, it wasn't challenging. It was just, um, it took uh, almost two years, let's say, a little under, about two years. And Mithal used to come and have uh, endless cups of coffee with me. And we would sit and discuss things together. But it wasn't challenging. It was... Um, what would I? What could I call it? It was this was an insight that I had to take into myself. I had to go back into my interiors of my heart and my mind and my soul to be able to delve down and come up with what had moved me at that particular time, of how my life uh, regulated itself, how it how it inched its way forward. So it was a lot of. Um, going back and thinking about what you had done and reliving it. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of remembrance in that book, but it wasn't challenging. It was, it was very interesting to work on. It was, it was a great, uh, great feeling and an ex exhilarating feeling is what I'd put it at. That's wonderful. But do you think that with time, you know, your memories and perception of certain incidents changes? Did you feel that while you were recounting everything? Uh, that's a very good question. Yes, you, it does change, but certain things, for instance, don't. Certain things are like imprinted in your memory, like my wedding day or uh, the day somebody uh, told me that I was an adopted child, which the book starts with. Okay. And those things. Um, imprinted on your memory and they they hurt or the things that hurt you the things that moved you the things that you loved having the things that excited you all those things are sort of mentioned in the book of course everything that you go through cannot be mentioned but in broad terms everything is mentioned and you can you can see how I went through the life and how how um, things evolved. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be lovely to read it now. And I'm sure even when you read the book now, perhaps some things may occur to you that you hadn't thought yeah. of when they were happening. Yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. You're very right. When you go back and you think about it, you say, oh my gosh, really? Look at this. Look at this, how, how this happened this way. Did it really happen this way? You begin to sort of question sometimes and wonder and... And so many truths come out. Absolutely. So many things that you didn't, which are hidden in your subconscious sometimes come out. And uh, that's what made it, I think, uh, very uh, exhilarating for me to write the book. So tell us about the title. How did you decide A Full Life would be the right title for your book? Well, it was actually Metali who came up with the the title and I said you know I, I they, they thought about various titles and uh, I, I said I want something just a very short and something which is because I have had 
and it's amazing that in my manual I have read uh, it, some. It's there. There is a word that that was there, and I had said underneath that that she lived a full life. And I thought to myself, how come nobody has ever thought of this title? It's such an easy title. It's such a simple title, and so many people have led full lives that they haven't used the title. So I was quite shocked and. I said, well, this is it. This is what I want because it has been a full life. And as far as I'm concerned now, the last thing I always wanted to write a book about myself, that was my ambition. And now my ambition has been completed. So I'm going to be ending on that note to tell you that that was my ambition for a long time to write it. And now it has been fulfilled. So I am a very satisfied human being at this moment and very fulfilled really fulfilled that's amazing that's something that we all hope we we get that feeling you know by the time we are ready to say that we have had full lives so thank you so much uh, for joining us ma'am it was an absolute pleasure we are unfortunately running a little bit out of time otherwise i had many more questions to ask you but perhaps we can do this another time thank you so very much Thank you. Thank you so much, Noor. You've been a wonderful interviewer.